We have the privilege again this morning of opening the Word of God, opening our Bibles. Can you imagine you lived in the in the Middle Ages and only a Latin Bible was available and no one could read it except some priest? And here we are many years later, 500 years later, and we can read the Scriptures in our own language. Praise the Lord. So Luke chapter 5 this morning, you can turn in your Bible to Luke 5, verse 27 to 32. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the availability of Scripture in our own language, for your most holy and precious word, more precious than gold and sweeter than honey to our taste a hammer that breaks rock in pieces and a fire that purifies, water that cleanses. We praise you for your word and we pray that you would give us open ears to hear and we pray that you would work mightily in our midst today for the sake of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and our Saviour. Amen. The theme I've chosen for this message is in the form of a question. And the question is, do you qualify for the kingdom? Do you qualify for the kingdom? Now, any child, if, if the father of that child buys an ice cream only for one of the children, it's obvious you're going to have an unhappy child. And some people think that way when it comes to God. They think God is unfair. Because how can you qualify for the kingdom? How can God's kingdom only be for for some people? And because they think that way, they think that the kingdom of God must be for everyone. But the Bible teaches differently and tells us that the kingdom is not for everyone. For instance, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in heart or the poor in spirit, for to them or theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or in Matthew 5, Jesus says, if your righteousness is not more than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom. Uh, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, on that day, Jesus says, but obviously, not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but those who do the will of the Father who is in heaven. Or, Matthew 18, Jesus says, if you don't become like one of these little children, you will never enter the kingdom. Uh, Same in Matthew 19. Matthew 19, Jesus says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. He says that people who have a lot of money, it will be very hard for them to enter the kingdom. Or in Matthew chapter 21, uh, Jesus says that the Jews will be cast out of the kingdom and the kingdom will be taken from them and given to a nation who will produce good fruit, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of obedience. Or also in Matthew 21, in verse 31, Jesus says that the tax collectors and the prostitutes enter the kingdom before the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, Matthew 22, we read of the kingdom of heaven, there's this parable, and then in the end of the parable you find a man at the wedding, but he's not... He hasn't got the proper wedding garments on, the wedding clothes on, and he's cast out of the kingdom, out of the wedding hall, so he doesn't qualify. Uh, Jesus even said, if you put your hand to the plow, you're going to plow, and then you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. Oh, in Luke 13, Jesus uh, speaks of another parable. People are asking him, will many enter the kingdom? Will many be able? And then he says, no. Uh, Many will say to him on that day, Lord, Lord, and so on, but you preached in our streets and all of this, and Jesus will say, no, they cannot enter the kingdom. They will be cast out, but from the north, east, south, and west, people will enter the kingdom. That's the Gentiles. Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. And the same. then he mentions a list of sins like uh, drunkards and adulterers and homosexuals and robbers and so on. They won't enter the kingdom. In Galatians 5, Paul the Apostle Paul writes a- another list of sins and he 
And he says, people who continue in these kinds of things, they will not inherit the kingdom. Ephesians 5 verse 5, the same. Colossians 1 verse 13, we read where Paul says in actually Colossians 1 verse 12 uh, and verse 13, we read of the Apostle Paul writing that we should thank God because he's qualified us to share in the kingdom and he's transferred us from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. So it's obvious, not everyone qualifies for the kingdom and Luke 5 tells us the same. So let us read Luke 5 verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made Jesus a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Number one, we're going to look at Matthew's calling. That is in verse 27 and 28. You remember what happened in South Africa some years ago when Etol, the highways were jacked up and then fixed and then they... Then they put in Etol, and South Africans were in uproar against Etol. Why should we pay Etol? Look at the government. They're just oppressing us with higher and higher taxes. and We're already paying a lot of tax on fuel and diesel and petrol, and then the the services that we need to get, well, they don't deliver services. Just look at our electricity problems and water problems and the bad state of our roads. They don't fix potholes, so why should we pay more? And that's exactly how the Jews felt. The Jews hated tax collectors. Like in Luke 18, verse 9 to 11, you see them all. Matthew 5 at the end, Matthew 18, verse 17, they hated tax collectors. Because the tax collectors worked for the Romans. They worked for the Roman Empire. And they took money from the Jews and then gave it to the Roman Caesar or to King Herod. And then they even crooked people, they extorted money, they oppressed people, they bullied people into paying more. So you pay more than you're actually supposed to pay and then this tax collector sticks the money in his own pocket, in his own wallet. Like we read in Luke 3 verse 12 and 13 or even Zacchaeus in Luke 19 before he was saved. And this is exactly the kind of character we're dealing with in verse 27. So the man's name is Levi in verse 27. But according to Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9, his other name is Matthew. So Levi is one name, but he's also called Matthew, the son of Alphaeus. And here he is sitting in Capernaum, and we know this is Capernaum on the shore of the Lake of Galilee, uh, in the northern shore. We know this from Mark, chapter 2. So he's sitting in, in the tax booth where he's gathering money from people. And as he sits sitting there, Jesus walks past In verse 27, Jesus is on his way to the Sea of Galilee, we learn from Mark 2. And when Jesus sees him, Jesus says to him, follow me, verse 27. Now there's a whole theology locked up in those two small words, follow me. For instance, one thing we learn from that, follow me, is that Jesus chose you before you chose him. Because Jesus came to Matthew here and said, follow me. Matthew didn't go seeking for Jesus. And we know this from many passages of Scripture. Um, For instance, John 15, verse 16, Jesus says, I chose you, you didn't choose me. No one can come to me unless unless the Father draws him, unless it's given him by my Father. Or you look at Zacchaeus, it says Jesus went to Zacchaeus. Yes, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5, we read that God chose us before the foundation of the world. And then only did we believe in him. Later in verse 13 of Ephesians 1, Acts 13 verse 48, all those appointed to eternal life believed. So God first destines you to eternal life and then you believe. Another lesson from the words follow me is that Jesus, yes you chose Jesus also, you responded. uh, But the reason you chose Jesus is because he drew you to himself. God drew you to his son, John 6 verse 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. 
Now, I don't mean by that, that that Jesus forces you to believe. But what, I, what I'm saying is that he opens your heart. He opens your mind to understand the gospel, the good news of salvation. He enables you. He even makes you willing to follow him. Acts 16 verse 14, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to understand what Paul was saying. Or Philippians 2 verse 12, you must work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you so that you can be willing, so that you can be able, the, the, the text tells us. Another lesson from the words, follow me. When, when an unbeliever hears the gospel, what does he hear? He hears a human voice. If you're not a Christian this morning, you're hearing my voice here. But when God saves you, you hear another voice. It's not a voice you hear with your ears. It's a voice you hear in the depth of your being, in the depth of your soul. You hear the voice of God calling you to new life. He has called you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He has called you to life. He has caused you to be born again. He has called you out of darkness to His marvelous light. And when that happens, you cannot... Do anything other. You will not. You don't want to do anything else, but you want to follow him like, like Levi or Matthew in verse 28. Leaving everything, he rose and he followed Jesus. That's what you want to do. Now, in big terms, we call that irresistible grace. It's like, it's like the blossoms of spring. The blossoms of spring, they open automatically when the season arrives. No one forces this blossom to open. No one takes his fingers and pries open the leaves. But it's like these blossoms, they cannot do anything else. They must open, because the life of the tree is in them. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is that you are dependent, 100% dependent on Jesus to save you. If Jesus doesn't work in you, you will never choose Jesus. But where Jesus comes and he works in your heart, you cannot resist him. You don't want to resist him. You will follow him like Matthew. Jesus says, follow me. Immediately he gets up and he follows Christ. And that's what you should pray for those unbelieving friends of yours or family members of yours. Pray that God will open their their eyes. Pray that God will help them to see the irresistible purity and loveliness and beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that they would commit their lives to him and become his disciples. Because if they see, once they see the glory of Jesus, the brightness, the brilliance, the beauty, the wonder of Jesus, then money will not hold them back anymore. Pleasures of this world or their friends won't hold them back any longer. They will follow Jesus. They'll leave everything to follow Jesus, like Matthew in verse 28, like Levi. Why? Because they've suddenly they've seen that here's a value. Here's a value more than all this money I've got. Here's a value. Here's a beauty, here's a wonder, here's a glory. And besides, I'm going to lose my BMW and my house and all my investments, and I'm going to lose it the day I die. And so they follow Christ. Because now they've seen. So perhaps you're not a disciple of Jesus yet. You're not a follower of Jesus. Yes, you know Jesus, you know about Him, you know His name. You're religious maybe, but you're not a follower of Jesus then I want to ask you, will you, will you swap these temporal treasures for the eternal treasure of Jesus Christ? Give up these treasures. Give up these things of this world and follow Jesus. Will you follow Jesus? If you hear him calling your name today, saying to you, John and Mary and Susan and Mpo and Jack and Simon, follow me. Number two, the... the Pharisee's reaction. The Pharisee's reaction. That's verse 29 and 30. Now, Dr. Seuss, he wrote a book called The Grinch. And The Grinch, as many of you know, is a very miserable character. But he's not miserable alone. He wants to make everything, everyone around him miserable too. And so The Grinch steals Christmas. And that's what the Pharisees were like. They are not happy when sinners come to Jesus. They are not happy when sinners are saved. And so what happened is the following. When Jesus saved Matthew, and he called Matthew to be his disciples, what Matthew did is he had had this feast for Jesus in verse 29. 
And it's like Matthew, he cannot express his gladness enough. He cannot believe Jesus saved me. Jesus called me. Jesus chose me. And it's the same with any Christian. We're so filled with thankfulness and gratefulness when the Lord saves us. That's why we sing praises as Christians. And, and that's why we, we want other people to sing praises with us. We want to invite our friends like Matthew did. We want them to be saved too, so that they can praise Jesus too. It's like having the best, going to the best restaurant in town. You've discovered this restaurant, or maybe you've seen some beautiful scenery in nature. Yes, it makes you happy, but your joy is only complete when you share it with someone. You want to show someone. You want to tell someone. And so that's why Matthew invited his friends, the tax collectors in verse 29. He invites other tax collectors. He invites other people. He invites all these sinners, says Matthew 9 verse 10. And he wants them to meet Jesus too. Because he knows that his friends are lost. They're not saved yet. Their sins aren't forgiven. They're still in their sins. He wants them to meet Jesus. He wants them to taste and see that the Lord is good. Now according to history, this is not in the Bible... But according to church history, Matthew, he won many people to the Lord. Not only these friends. He won many people to the Lord in Egypt and in Ethiopia. We read this in Fox's Book of Martyrs. And he did it with such dedication and such devotion and such passion that in the end, it cost him his life. Because a certain king called Hyrcanus rammed him and pierced him with a spear. And Matthew died. For the gospel. And will we, not, will we not take time to share the gospel with others. To invite others to church. And to invite others to come and meet the friend of sinners. Jesus, the friend of sinners. J.C. Ryle said, A converted man, a saved man, will not wish to go to heaven alone. But obviously, as you and I both know, Satan will not be happy with us. If you start inviting unbelievers to church and you start sharing the gospel with them. And, and the people that the devil will use to try and prevent you from sharing the gospel is very strange and interesting. He will use religious people. These are the kinds of people, these religious people, that, that you unclean, they, wanna, they want to avoid unclean people. They'll even, even when people arrive at church, they'll... Sh- Show them the door and say, leave this church. This is our church. We don't want troublemakers in this church. Now, I don't know of anyone in our church who does that. But are there people in our church? You've never spoken to them. You've never really met them. You let even visitors, maybe, you let them, when we drink tea, I've seen this. You let them stand one side, aside. You don't mix and mingle with them because they don't look like you. you like these Pharisees in verse 30. Why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You like these Pharisees. And these people in our church that you don't mingle with, their names don't even come into your thoughts when you invite others for dinner at your home or invite them for coffee or tea. You don't invite these people. You don't even think of them because they're not your type, you know. They're not your type. And you know some of your friends won't come to the bride if you invite these other people. But shouldn't we remember that you and I, we ourselves were lost? So why do you think you're better than others? Like the Pharisees here. Why do you eat with and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Don't think you're better. We're not better than others. Don't divide the people into good people and bad people. Rather divide the, the, the world uh, rather divide the world into sinners who are saved by grace and sinners who still need to hear the gospel, repent and believe. Because if you see things in this light, then you won't be like the Pharisees where they are. We don't want to mix with washouts, you know. You won't be like that. No, you'll share the gospel with the lost. And you'll say to yourself, if the Lord could save me, certainly he can save them. Number three, Jesus' answer. Verse 31 and 32 we see there. Now let me tell you about Nick. Nick has got cancer in the bladder. And he knows, he can feel something's not right, but he doesn't have pain. He doesn't have pain because apparently cancer in your bladder, you can have cancer and not feel pain. 
so he doesn't feel any pain and so he doesn't go to the doctor and eventually things become so bad he dies. You know, there are many people like Nick when it comes to spiritual things. They don't realize how sick they are. They don't realize how sinful they are. They believe, oh, I'm fine. I'm spiritually fine. Spiritually, I'm so healthy. And so because they trust in their religion, because they trust in their good works, they don't turn to the heavenly doctor for forgiveness. And that's exactly the point Jesus is trying to make in verse 31 and 32. It's as if Jesus is saying, until you realize that you are lost, you'll never turn to Jesus and ask him to save you. And you won't qualify for the kingdom. Or to quote C.S. Lewis, quote, Christianity tells people to repent and promises them forgiveness. It has nothing, as far as I know, it has nothing to say to people who do not know that they have done anything to repent of and who do not feel that they need forgiveness, end quote. So don't measure yourself against the prostitutes and the robbers and the addicts and then think, well, I'm okay, I'm not like them. Why not rather measure yourself against God's standard? In Matthew 5, verse 21 to 30, for instance, where Jesus says, bitterness is the same as murder, and lust is the same as adultery. Measure yourself against that, and then you tell yourself, do you pass the test or not? And maybe you should tell yourself, you're worse than the prostitute. We are worse than the prostitute. If you're a self-righteous person, you're worse than a prostitute, because at least the prostitute knows she is evil. But you sitting under the pulpit, you sitting in the church, you sitting in the pew, you sitting under the Bible, and you think everything is right, not realizing you lost. You know, many Afrikaners are, are this way. And not only Afrikaners, the other nationalities and other tribes and languages also. But I know, I know this because I've worked with many Afrikaners. If you ask them about their salvation testimony, how were you saved? Everything they tell you and talk about is about themselves. And they know. They'll tell you even. I know I'm not perfect. But in their, in their eyes, well, at least God will accept me as long as I try my best. And you hear nothing of the death of Jesus on the cross. You hear nothing of the person of Jesus Christ. It's just absent from their testimony. They don't even mention it. And if, if by accident they say something about Jesus or the cross, it's just in passing. But for the main part, everything is about them. It's about how good they are. It's about what they do for the Lord instead of what Jesus has done for them. Jesus has done for us through his life, death and resurrection. And so I hope you can see that the false believer, someone who's not truly a Christian, the false believer, he wants to share the glory between him and God. He doesn't give God all the glory for salvation. He wants to take some of the glory and say, but look what I've done. Where the true Christian, he realizes, I could and can do nothing to save myself. And so he gives all the glory to Christ alone. So because this, this false believer because he's self-righteous and he thinks, but I've added something, I've, I've contributed something to my salvation. Because that is true and the, that's the way he thinks, he doesn't have a heart full of thankfulness. For instance, when there's the Lord's Supper, there's the bread and the wine. He hasn't got a heart full of thankfulness because look what Jesus has done for me. And when we sing songs about the death of Jesus for our sins, what moves him? What moves him really emotionally is the music. Or maybe it's the tune. It's not the words. It's not the truth that he's singing about. It's not the Lord Jesus himself. And he doesn't talk to other people about the cross. Why would he? Why would he talk about the cross if it means nothing to him? He's not like Paul in Galatians 6 verse 14 where he boasts about the cross. He glories in the cross. He brags about the cross. Look what Jesus has done. Look how glorious Jesus is. No, he doesn't brag about Jesus. But he brags about, look what every look at all these things I've done for the church. Look at my clean life. And he brags about the missionary trip he went on 20 years ago. And he brags in the fact, I was an elder, you know, and all of these kinds of things. And if you like that, if you're that way, you need a, a spiritual CT scan, a spiritual MRI scan. So that you can see you're not straight on your way to heaven like you've been thinking all these years. 
And perhaps you think this way because, but look at my life, you know. Outwardly I'm living a clean life and a good life. But according to whose standard, may I ask? Do you, do you measure up against God's standard? Where he says in Isaiah 64 verse 4 that your best deeds are like filthy rags. All your righteousness, it's like rubbish to the Lord. You must be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. Are you? Jesus said you must be. Or if you break one law, you've broken the whole law. You are under a curse, Galatians 3 verse 10. So how, how do you fare? How's it going? Do you pass the test? If you measure yourself against, what about the Ten Commandments? Now maybe you say, well, I've checked myself against the Ten Commandments. And you know, you're like the rich young ruler in, in, um, in Luke chapter 18. And you say, but I, I, I do keep the Ten Commandments. I really do. I try to do it all the time. But may I ask you, what about your thought life? What about your desires? What about the unforgiveness and the bitterness in your heart, in your, in your thoughts? What about the lust? What about the greed? What about the materialism and chasing money? What about the un gratefulness and the jealousy and the discontentment and being irritated and the anger and the pride and the, the selfishness and the impatience and the critical spirit. What about those things? Stop justifying yourself. Just acknowledge you are guilty. You have sinned against God. Acknowledge it. Simply acknowledge it. And come to the heavenly doctor in order to be healed. Because until you do so, you cannot be saved. Verse 31, Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is not saying to the Pharisees they are righteous. He's saying you will never come for salvation until you acknowledge your sickness. But if you do acknowledge that you are spiritually ill because of your sin, then God the Father will accept the life and the death of Jesus Christ in your place. And he won't see you any longer as the guilty sinner, but he will see you as someone who has a perfect record of righteousness, as someone who has been covered in the righteousness of his Son, Jesus Christ. Now perhaps today, you realize with a shock, that you're not a Christian, even though you thought for many years you were. Well, you should actually, you should thank God for His grace, because He has revealed this to you today. You, you, you've been like a blind person just walking in the field, taking a stroll, and you at peace, not realizing you are on your way to a cliff. You should thank God that He has woken you from your, your sleep. He has, he has he's shaken you awake so that you can see you lost and you won't remain naive and think you're on your way to heaven because you're not. And this is also necessary so that you can repent and turn to the Lord. Verse 32, I've not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And if you repent, you'll be forgiven. That's what Jesus is, he said in verse 32. That's why he came. So that you can repent and be forgiven. Luke 24 verse 47. Proclaim repentance and forgiveness. Luke, uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Repent and then we read the rest of the verse. You'll be forgiven. So may I ask you, religious person. May I ask you. You religious people trusting in your own good works. Do you hear the voice of Jesus calling? Or maybe you're a Christian and you've backslidden. Do you hear the voice of Jesus calling? Children, young people, may I ask you, you grew up in a Christian home perhaps, and you know all the right answers, but you're still living in your sin. Do you hear the call of Jesus? Sinner, you who are caught in the net of addiction, in the snare of addiction, in the trap of addiction, do you hear the call of Jesus? Or self-deceived person, you think you're saved because you say, I've given my heart to Jesus, but your life hasn't changed. Do you hear the call of Jesus? Believer, Christian, you're being tempted by the world. Do you hear the call of Jesus? Believer who's walking on the right way, 
You're on the right path, but you become weary and tired. Do you hear the call of Jesus? Well, then come to Jesus. And don't listen to those preachers who tell you, Jesus will accept you. He accepts you just as you are. He doesn't. Jesus wants to change you. Come, ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. He is able. He is able. He is willing. Doubt no more. Come, ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you better, you will never come at all. Not the righteous. Not the righteous. Sinners. Jesus came to call. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we bless and praise your most high and most holy name for calling sinners to salvation. Lord Jesus, all worship and honor and glory belongs to you for calling sinners to salvation. Holy Spirit, praise and honor, thanksgiving belongs to you for calling sinners to salvation. We give you the glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.